Warning, the following message may be offensive to some audiences. These audiences may include, but are not limited to, professing Christians who never read their Bible, sissies, sodomites, men with man buns, those who approve of men with man buns, man bun enablers, white knights for men with man buns, homemakers who have finished Netflix but don't know how to meal plan, and people who refer to their pets as fur babies. Viewer discretion is advised. People are tired of hearing nothing but doom and despair on the radio. The message of Christianity is that salvation is found in Christ alone, and any who reject Christ therefore forfeit any hope of salvation, any hope of heaven. The issue is that humanity is in sin and the wrath of Almighty God is hanging over our heads. They will hear his words, they will not act upon them, and when the floods of divine judgment, when the fires of wrath come, they will be consumed and they will perish. God wrapped himself in flesh, condescended, and became a man, died on the cross for sin, was resurrected on the third day, has ascended to the right hand of the Father, where he sits now to make intercession for us. Jesus is saying there is a group of people who will hear his words, they will act upon them, and when the floods of divine judgment come in that final day, their house will stand. Welcome to Bible Bashed, where we aim to equip the saints for the works of ministry by answering the questions you're not allowed to ask. Listen and enjoy this installment of Iron Sharpening Iron as Pastor Tim answers your sincere questions. Here's Pastor Tim. On this episode of Iron Sharpening Iron, we're going to be answering the question, Are gays worse sinners than normal people? Now, uh, immediately when you hear a question like that, one of the things that, uh, if you're a Christian, and you have some sort of self-awareness, one of the things that you might uh, think immediately is that you might realize that you're a sinner and that all people are sinners. There's none righteous, no, not one. Uh, we've all turned uh, aside. Uh, we've all pursued our own way. There's none that do, does good, no, not one. We realize that we're all sinners. We all stand equally condemned before a holy God. We understand that just one sin will separate us from uh, from God, uh, that uh, if we're guilty of one sin, that we in some sense have rejected the whole law of God, God's standards perfection, none of us meet that standard, we all stand equally condemned. Uh, we realize that also, you know, related to the topic matter, our gays were sinners to normal people, we realize that there will be many individuals who are attracted to members of the opposite sex who will end up in hell. And we also understand that there will be many people who uh, have deviant sexual temptations who will also end up in hell. Um, the issue of the nature of a person's attractions, whether uh, normal as God designed them to be or deviant uh, and, and corrupted, is... Uh, that in of itself is neither salvific uh, nor uh, uniquely uh, condemning, meaning that um, that the presence of those things does not in some simplistic way guarantee that an individual will go to hell, and then the absence of those things uh, doesn't in any kind of simplistic way guarantee that they're going to go to heaven. So there's you know there are plenty of wicked sinners who happen to never have. Uh, been tempted towards uh, sodomy their entire lives. There's plenty of individuals. I imagine Hitler was one of those individuals who was never tempted that way in, in the course of his whole life. Maybe there's historical evidence I'm unaware of that suggests the contrary. But I imagine that there there is uh, plenty of uh, you know uh, dictators out there who have committed a great amount of evil in the world who uh, will uh, no doubt end up in hell. Uh, and there is no salvation through a normal sexual orientation, uh, to use the obnoxious language that our society is uh, intent upon using. So uh, when you think about it that way, all of us stand equally condemned before God. We all enter into the world uh, with the inherited guilt of our, our father Adam. Uh, there's nothing we can do about it. We all stand condemned. Uh, in some sense, we all uh, uh, we all obviously fall short of God's standard of perfection. We all are desperately in need of a Savior. Yes and amen to all that. Now, the question, though, remains, are gays worse sin sinners than normal people? And that kind of person that I just said who acknowledges all those things might hear that kind of question 
uh, to be the kind of question that uh, the only person who would answer yes to would be someone like Stephen Anderson or the Westboro Baptist uh, individuals who, who really do seem to revel in their hatred towards uh, individuals who um, commit sins that they would never dare to commit. And they do really they really do seem to be the sorts of people who say, thank God I am not like these vile sinners uh, in their pride and their hypoc- hypocrisy and everything else. At the same time, however, one of the things to realize is that the Bible is not the kind of book that engages in sin leveling, both on a human level and also uh, from the divine perspective. There are sins that are clearly worse than other sins. And what I mean by that is that there are any number of sins that an individual can commit, Uh, you know, a lack of gratitude, a lack of thanklessness, uh, pride, um, you know, arrogance, uh, boasting, uh, covetousness. Uh, there, you know, even lust. Uh, an individual can c- commit any number of sins that are, are uh, heinous and disgusting before the eyes of God. And at the same time, God did not command the death penalty for every sin that, that happens to exist. So just take a, uh, let's change the subject to murder, for instance, and try to respond to this question as it relates to that. Uh, just uh, pause for a second and think about the way that murder works. Now, uh, anger is the kind of sin that inevitably, if you feed it and if you feed it and if you feed it, you should not be surprised if ultimately one day your anger culminates in murder. Now, when Jesus comments on um, anger and murder in the Sermon on the Mount, he essentially says that uh, that you know if you're uh, you, you know you think that you're okay essentially because you haven't committed murder, but if you're angry with your brother, you basically have committed murder in your heart. That's that's the, that's his comment, and the same thing goes for lust. You think, hey, you know, you're fine because you didn't break the command to not have adultery. But if you have lust for a woman in your heart, you committed adultery in your heart. Uh, one of the things that Jesus is doing on the Sermon on the Mount is he's rebuking the kind of person who says, hey, I didn't, com- I didn't commit physical adultery. Hey, I didn't commit physical murder, so I must be okay. I've kept the commandments. But then the problem, though, is to say that uh, there's more to these commandments than just the external action. There's also the internal attitude. So anger, in a certain sense, is connected to murder. Uh, Now, to give an analogy to to, uh, compare the two, uh, you, you might consider, you know, and often as you read through the scriptures, uh, the scriptures will consider anger a fire. So think about anger as a fire. Now, uh, there are forms of anger that are small, like a, you, uh, there's uh, different types of anger that exist in the world. So like frustration and irritation and annoyance and all this. These are what uh, many have described as baby anger. Now, if you consider baby anger a fire and you think about it as a fire, uh, is a little fire you know, it's just imagine like a little two inch by two inch fire by the side of your house. Is that a is that a problem? You know, it's obviously a problem. Is it bad? It's obviously bad. But is it as bad as uh, the a fire that has grown to the point where your entire house is set on fire? Well, no. I think everyone would prefer that that fire remain that little. Uh, baby thing. Now, ultimately, if you let it go, will it not grow and will it not grow and will it not get worse? Have you not known plenty of people who are dominated by bitterness um, to where bitterness becomes a comprehensive uh, state of their life? Sure. And doesn't that lead to all sorts of other problems? Sure. But here's the thing. Uh, not all sin is the same. So anger is not the same as murder. It's just coming from the same kind of thing. So both anger and murder are a fire. You might want to picture it that way. But uh, but essentially murder is the fire of anger when it has grown uh, and grown and grown and at some point got out of control. Now, one of the things that happens is when Jesus comes along and says, hey, you know, anger is essentially heart murder. One of the things he's not doing is, is essentially saying that anytime anyone expresses anger, you need to put them to death. No, because <laughs> anger... W- w- you know, it's obviously sinful, but it's not sinful to the degree in terms of uh, its functional uh, functionality or practice. It's not as sinful in degree as when you take anger to the point where you uh, are so mad at a person that you want to remove their existence from the earth. Uh, so obviously, uh, anger, when it's metastasized to that level, has become a significantly worse moral issue. Now, none of it's none of it's good. None of it's right. None of it will justify you before, or all of it will equally condemn you before a holy God. But at the same time, there are obviously levels of consequences to certain things. And if you let your anger get out of control and out of control, you should warn people that one day you may commit murder. And you you, you know you you hold on to that anger. You you don't know where it's going to lead you.
But at the same time, murder is objectively, both on a human level and from the divine uh, perspective, worse than anger. Now, in the same way, lust is a problem. So heterosexual lust can lead to all sorts of problems. Heterosexual lust can lead to infidelity. Heterosexual lust can lead to uh, all sorts of significant moral problems. Uh, but then when, you, when you're talking about an issue like sodomy, one of the things you might realize is that sodomy is also a sin that was listed under the Old Covenant as the type of sin that if an individual engaged in it, they were to be put to death. It was a capital punishment offense. So from God's perspective, yes, sodomy is far worse than just normal lust. Uh, when you let uh, this deviant lust advance to the level where you actually act on it, that is the type of sin that God tells, uh, 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 that God uh, considers to be a death penalty uh, offense. It considers it to be an abomination. Now, in the language of Romans 1, one of the things that you're going to find is if you go to Romans 1 and you think about what's happening, uh, mankind rejects God. It refuses to worship God. It refuses to glorify God, uh, God as God or give thanks. It uh, rejects the knowledge of God found in nature uh, and professing to be wise becomes fools. And one of the things that realize in verse uh, Romans one eighteen, God says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So here's the thing. Uh, verse 21, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him or give thanks, but became futile in their thinking. Uh, and foolish, their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse uh, 24, Therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Uh, one of the things to realize is that when individuals are given over to sodomy, this is a particularly advanced form of uh, of the rejection of the knowledge of God it is a sign itself of judgment against uh, of God's judgment against the society uh, and it's obviously a sign of God's judgment against the society because there is nothing that stands against uh, more against God's fundamental purposes for human beings in this world than the idea of same-sex relations one of the first commands that God has given to the human race is uh, the command to be fruitful and multiply and in uh, same-sex relationships if you want to call them that are relationships which fundamentally stand at total odds with all of God's purposes. And whenever you reject God's purposes in such a comprehensive way, one of the things to realize is that there are there are entailments and there are consequences to that sort of thing. And so uh, one of the things that we can't do as Christians is, is to simply pretend as if all sin is equally uh, heinous in the eyes of God and all sin is uh, equally as bad. Uh, it would be far better for a society, let me say something that's outrageous, it would be far better for a society to... Uh, to uh, be filled with normal lust than it would be for a society to be filled with uh, same-sex lust. And the reason for that is obvious. If the entire society was given over to same-sex lust, one of the things that would happen is the human race would cease to exist, okay? Uh, so uh, this is a significant problem and it's, it's a kind of problem that uh, it shows a particular advanced form of rebellion against God and it's the kind of problem that um, God reserves the death penalty for so we shouldn't in some simplistic kind of way pretend as if all sins are the same now obviously there's a kind of person who basically pats himself on the back with that kind of knowledge and say hey well you know thank God I'm not like these you know homosexuals who with a uh, their filthy attractions and, and individuals like that may be Stephen Anderson and uh, Westboro Baptist. And, and, you know, there are errors that are made along those lines where you know, individuals like Stephen Anderson really do seem to think, and, and some independent fundamentalist Baptists seem to really think that sodomy is uh, the kind of sin that results, that there's uh, evidence of such a perversion that this uh, person is a fundamentally unable to be saved and the Bible never uh, describes any class of person as being fundamentally irredeemable uh, by by nature of any sin they, that, that they commit. In fact, uh, you know, it's in the Bible, some of the individuals who, who um, 
commit the most scandalous sins are the ones who become the best followers of Christ. And so uh, part of that is because the one who's been forgiven much loves much. And and the worst sins that functionally sometimes people commit in this life, the more it reminds them of grace and the more they're devoted to turning from those things with the whole heart instead of being like the older brother who can't see their own sin. And so there's that. There's always an offer of salvation given to anyone who uh, will repent of their sins and believe the good news and put their faith in Christ. Uh, this is true for uh, individuals with normal sexual attractions, and this is true for individuals who are tempted towards deviant forms of sexual immorality. Uh, there's always hope that if you repent of your sins, put your faith in Christ, and turn from it, um, that you will be saved. But at the same time, not all sins are equal, and not all sins are equally bad in terms of God's perspective of it or the punishments that are associated with it as well. This has been another installment of Iron Sharpening Iron. As always, if you would like to have your question included in one of these midweek episodes, email us at BibleBashedPodcast at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Gab. Now, go boldly and obey the truth in the midst of a biblically illiterate world who will be perpetually offended by your every move. Mm-hmm.